Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today I'd like to begin spending some time in the year 1971, looking at the pop culture of the times, what our old friends the Beach Boys were up to, and most importantly, spending some time taking an in-depth look at their 1971 release, Surf's Up. Now in the past, when I've looked at individual years like this, 1977, 1985, for example, I've split the year into thirds with one episode for each third of the year and then one episode about the album. When I started researching 1971, I realized that I would have to leave out huge amounts of information that I think are quite interesting to fit it into that short a period. In fact, apart from anything else, there was just a lot of important music released in 1971. There were a lot of big acts, there were a lot of landmark albums, and apart from anything else, a lot of those acts were still releasing two or three albums a year, so there's just a lot to get to. So we're going to have to be a little bit more ambitious. I'll try to split this into four episodes about each quarter of the year, with one episode focusing on the Surf's Up album. I'm also going to limit the discussion of albums to albums that reached 15 or higher on the charts, to give a better idea of what the actual impression of music was if you were there in 1971. This means that there will be a lot of well-loved, critically revered, and influential albums from 71 that were kind of overlooked at the time, didn't chart that highly that we won't be talking about. Things such as Van Morrison's Tupelo Honey album, Pink Floyd's Metal, David Bowie's Hunky Dory album, and T-Rex Electric Warrior, although this did have a hit single with Bang A Gong, Get It On in early 72, the album really never charted that highly in the U.S. So let's begin with a look at January through March of 1971. As the year began, Richard Nixon was nearly halfway through his term as president, though it was widely assumed he would run for re-election in 1972. Big issues facing the country continued to be the Vietnam War and rampant inflation at home. As we'll see throughout these episodes, there was also a new level of political and social awareness sweeping the country. Of course, the civil rights movement and the struggle to end the war in Vietnam continued. There was also women's liberation, Native American rights, a new awareness of ecology, a movement towards simplicity or back to nature reflected in things like communal living, new spiritual pursuits, health foods, experiments in urban planning, an interest in historic building preservation, and a vogue for antiques. Of course, none of these things was new in 1971, but they did seem to rank higher in the American consciousness at the time, which is something that we'll see reflected in the media and particularly in music as we talk about the year. In news from early 1971, on February 5th, 1971, Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell of Apollo 14 landed on the moon. In their two walks on the lunar surface, we got live television coverage for the second time. The first was Apollo 11 in July 1969. When Apollo 12 landed a few months later, their TV camera was broken. And of course, Apollo 13 in the spring of 1970 didn't make a landing at all. With Apollo 14, we had coverage again, and for the first time, it was in color. In one of the more memorable moments, Alan Shepard hit two golf balls on the moon. In other golfing news, on February 13th, Vice President Spiro Agnew hit three spectators with his first two shots at the Bob Hope Golf Classic in Palm Springs. After that, he abandoned the game, got into his golf cart, and drove off. Nobody was seriously hurt, but this became a major source of jokes on TV. Meanwhile, just a short distance away, the Los Angeles area was trying to recover and still experiencing aftershocks from the 6.6 .6 magnitude Silmar quake that had hit the area four days earlier on Tuesday, February 9th at 6 a.m. And on March 8th, 1971, the so-called fight of the century took place at Madison Square Garden between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Even if you didn't care about boxing or sports in general, this fight was inescapable. Muhammad Ali, of course, had refused the draft in 1967 and had consequently been stripped of his title as heavyweight champion. In the years after that, Frazier had become heavyweight champ. Now Ali was allowed to box again and was attempting to regain the title that had been stripped from him. Both were undefeated and you couldn't escape talk about it for weeks ahead of the fight. In fact, I was 10 years old and in Sunday school the day before the fight, and I remember the entire class time was taken up by discussion of whether Ali or Frazier would win the fight, and that wasn't from the kids, that was from the Sunday school teachers. In the end, Ali lost by a decision and Joe Frazier remained champion. 
Meanwhile, the Beach Boys had begun work on their new album, the follow-up to last August's Sunflower LP. Working at Brian's home studio, new manager Jack Riley and Carl were leading the way with progressive new songs like Long Promise Road and Feel Flows. According to Riley, there was initially some resistance from the non-Wilson members of the band, but soon they were all pulling in the same general progressive direction. The band did a number of live appearances early in 1971, including their first appearance at Carnegie Hall on February 24th. The next night, they taped an appearance on the David Frost Show, performing Forever, Vegetables, and Lady. Dennis really took the spotlight here, singing lead vocal on two of the three tracks, and during the interview portion of the show, talk centered on the soon-to-be-released movie Two Lane Blacktop, in which Dennis starred. Right around the same time, Esquire Magazine's April issue was hitting the stands with its cover story on Tulane Blacktop, which it called its nomination for the movie of the year. Unfortunately, the promotion was blunted by the film's release being put back to July. Big movies that you could see early in 1971 included David Lean's Ryan's Daughter, starring Robert Mitchum, which was released late in 1970 in time for Academy Award consideration. Also, Little Big Man, starring Dustin Hoffman, also for the Academy's consideration. There was the hit The Owl and the Pussycat, starring Barbara Streisand and George Siegel. Disney's animated film The Aristocats. If you were looking for something more macabre, you could catch Scars of Dracula, starring Christopher Lee, or Horror of Frankenstein. Depending on where you lived, you might even catch them on a double bill. Popular films released early in 1971 included Cold Turkey, a Norman Lear film starring Dick Van Dyke about an entire U.S. town trying to quit smoking. It was filmed in 1969 and shelved over a perceived lack of box office potential. When it was released in February of 1971, it became a hit. There was also the Robert Wise-directed science fiction film The Andromeda Strain, released in March of 1971. But the runaway box office hit of early 1971 was Love Story, starring Ally McGraw and Ryan O'Neill, based on the book by Eric Siegel, which was also number one on the New York Times bestseller list as the year began. The film's tagline offered, Love means never having to say you're sorry, which seems like really poor advice if you ask me. By the way, the New York Times number one nonfiction bestseller at this point remained Dr. David Rubin's Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. Another nonfiction book continuing to sell well was Alvin Toffler's Future Shock, which describes a psychological condition induced by societies experiencing too much change in too short a time. You can certainly understand how this theme would have resonated with a lot of Americans in 1971. In a lot of ways, the country was almost unrecognizable from the place it had been just eight years earlier. For a taste of just how much change had taken place, you might want to take a look at episode 82, U.S. Pop Culture 1963 Part 1, after viewing this video. One thing that had certainly changed were rock albums. After a long period of development, rock albums were now in full bloom, full of experiments, ideas, and concepts, and with that attitude reflected in the packaging. Rock albums now routinely came with posters, die-cut covers, gatefold sleeves, and in big multi-album box sets. Album releases became events, and there was a real attempt to wow the public with the packaging as well as the music. It was a great time to be buying albums. Case in point is the album that was number one as 1971 began, George Harrison's All Things Must Pass. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this album, which is a double set with a third record of in-studio jam sessions and a huge full-color poster of George. This is really a good example of just how far rock albums had come. Even the presentation in this type of box had mostly been reserved for classical albums up to this point. There had been a few rock albums in a box like this, but this was really making a statement that rock music, some of it anyway, needed to be treated seriously. I'm tempted to talk more about this album. I know that the Beatles get a lot of coverage on YouTube, but I have some theories about this album. If anybody's interested in me talking about this album a little more, getting away from the Beach Boys and maybe doing an episode on this, I'd like to do it. I just want to see if anybody's interested. Also, I could talk about it a little bit more when we eventually do a more detailed look at 1970. Let me know what you think about that. Anyway, also on the chart as 1971 began was... Abraxas by Santana, which had been number one on October 24, 1970. Reaching its number three peak was Stephen Still's first solo album, self-titled. And at number four, also its peak, was the Partridge Family album, 
In a lot of ways, 1971 was the year of the Partridge family, so we'll talk about them in more detail in one of the upcoming episodes. At number five was Grand Funk's live album. At number six, Sly and the Family Stone's greatest hits. At number seven, the original cast recording of Jesus Christ Superstar. This again shows just how far rock had come. A rock opera about Jesus Christ would have been absolutely unthinkable just a few years earlier. At number eight, we have the Carpenters' Close to You album. At number nine, Led Zeppelin III, which had been the number one album back in October of 1970. Rounding out the top ten, we had Creedence Clearwater Revival's Pendulum album. Other 1970 albums still doing well as the year began included Credence's prior album, Cosmos Factory, which had gone to number one in 1970, Bob Dylan's New Morning, and James Taylor's Sweet Baby James. James Taylor's career had skyrocketed from the time he began filming Two Lane Blacktop with co-star Dennis Wilson in August of 1970, when he was relatively unknown. The single, Fire and Rain, and the album had both gone to number three in the fall of 1970. And on March 1st, 1971, he was featured on the cover of the prestigious Time magazine as the face of the new rock, something we would today call the singer-songwriter genre. Other albums still doing well included Neil Young's After the Gold Rush, The Rolling Stones' live Get Your Yayas Out, The Jackson 5's third album, and other albums that were still climbing the chart as the year began included John Lennon's Plastic Ono Band album. In January of 1971, Rolling Stone magazine was running its landmark and almost masochistically candid interview with John Lennon. The album would eventually peak at number six. Elton John's self-titled album would eventually go to number four. Cat Stevens' Tea for the Tillerman would eventually reach number eight. The Osmonds album, with its Jackson 5-esque number one hit, One Bad Apple, was still climbing the chart. Sit Down, Young Stranger by Canadian singer-songwriter Gordon Lightfoot, who had an amazing voice. The album was rising on the strength of its number five hit, If You Could Read My Mind. Paranoid by Black Sabbath. And, not surprisingly, the soundtrack for Love Story, which would eventually go to number two. So that sort of does it for the 1970 albums that were still doing well or climbing the charts as 1971 began. As I suspected, this is running long. I haven't got to talk about hit singles. I haven't got to talk about any of the albums that were released in the first quarter of 1971. I haven't talked about television. There's a lot more that was going on in that first quarter of 1971 that I'd like to get to. So rather than just me quickly reciting a list and turning this into a marathon session, let's take a break now. We'll come back. We'll split this into two parts. Hope you don't mind that. Please let me know what you think of this. Please like and subscribe. Hope you're enjoying our deep dive into the year 1971, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.